the Medical School HQ podcast, session number 21. But that's yeah. the important stuff because that's the kind yeah. of information that, that you had mentioned earlier. If if you're thinking about doing this for money, don't. Yeah, and, and that's the kind of information that if you see that visually, you go, holy crap, uh, yeah, never mind. Yeah, you know, that's the kind of stuff that admissions offices and schools would not want them to hear. But I don't believe in that. I think you lay it all out and say, you know, you're going to take a little bit longer to get to where you have to go. You're going to work certainly a little bit harder than most. But if it's in you, and it is for a lot of people, then you got to do it. And we'll, and we'll together start planning those years. That's the thing that I have to get 21 and 22-year-olds or 23-year-olds to understand. You must start planning ahead now. Hello again. I am Ryan Gray, your host, back with you for another session of the Medical School HQ podcast, the podcast about medical school, where we take you through the pre-med process, medical school, and even through residency. We're here to take your knowledge of becoming a physician to the next level. Today, I have an awesome interview for you. I have Tony Sozo, the Director of Student Financial Planning at New York Medical College. That's where I went to medical school. Tony was there when I was there, and he was an invaluable asset to myself and every other student that goes through New York Medical College with their financial planning and setting them up for success in the future. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the podcast today, I want to remind you, if you're listening to this before May 2nd, 2013, the Princeton Review was generous enough to give us and you, the listeners of the Medical School HQ podcast, $250 off their MCAT Ultimate Classroom or Live Online course. You just have to enroll before May 2nd, 2013. To receive the discount, go to PrincetonReview.com and use the promo code MEDSCHOOLHQ250 at checkout. If you have any questions, you can actually call Anthony. He's the one that hooked us up with this. He can be reached at 888-758-7737, extension 5017. One other thing that I want to mention before we get started. Last week, or last podcast, I had asked you if you found this podcast valuable to go into iTunes and give us a ranking and a review. And three people did, and I just want to thank them. Lucy Maybe. Another CCIE and Hopeful MD all went into iTunes, left us awesome reviews, gave us five stars. We're up at 23 five-star ratings now, which is awesome. The way iTunes works is the more people rate and review a podcast, the more visible they are so other people can find us. So if you haven't rated us yet or left us a review and you find us valuable, if you could go into iTunes, I'll ask again, and give us a review and a rating. That would be amazing, and next week, I will thank you as well. After this podcast, where you're going to get a ton of great information about preparing yourself financially for medical school and what it's like to have that stress of several hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, after you listen and you have questions, we want you to interact with us. We want to know what you think about the podcast, what you think about the content. We've been hearing some great stuff from you guys out there already, and we want to keep hearing it. There are a couple ways to do that. Three, actually. The first way, we're on Twitter at Medical School HQ. You can email us, feedback at medicalschoolhq.net, or you can keep the conversation going in the comments section of this podcast at medicalschoolhq.net slash session 21. Some of the topics that we cover today with Tony, we cover the cost of going to medical school. Obviously, it's not cheap. It's a big burden and a big hurdle for a lot of people. We talk about the effect of your credit score and credit history on financing and, and what it's like to actually have a bankruptcy and, and applying for financial aid. We also talk about what actually goes into the creation of a, a yearly budget from a medical school and 
how is that affected if you have a wife and kids? Maybe medical school is a second career for you, and you you have a wife and kids, and you are the breadwinner, and now you're going back to school full-time and aren't working. We cover that and a lot more, so I hope you listen to the whole thing. It's great information. To start the podcast, I asked Tony what kind of stuff he discusses with applicants when they're going through the interview process when he first meets them at New York Medical College. Well, the first thing I tell the the applicants, and I see them, we do it a little differently now. I see them twice a week, but I pretty much will see all of the applicants coming through. The one thing I tell them, number one, is that they have options, that this isn't as daunting as they think it is, and that they should begin to realize they have to take ownership of this. Um, they're essentially borrowing, well, for a private school with living expenses, it's averaging 70000 And for a public school, it's, it's in that fifty six, fifty seven thousand 57000 a year range. So I tell them they really have to get involved in this. But there are options. And I begin to tell them that let's try to look further ahead, number one, and let's try to think of this as consumers. You are consumers. You're buying something, just as you would a tablet, a smartphone. You would certainly investigate it, and you'd, and you'd be pretty up on the, uh, the technical specs and what it can do. I said, this is the same kind of approach you got to take. You're pretty good at it, I said. Now I just shift gears. And I start to go into all the different repayment plans, some of the protections federal loans give them, some of the um, things they can do short-term and, and long-term. What I try to get them to think about is, fact that they could send money back within the first four months of any semester. And if you can change their mindset, not just let me get everything I can and spend it, but I'll borrow what I need. But if I can send money back, that's a good thing because, Ryan, that's setting them up for later. That's setting them up in their lives where they're going to be able to have more of their resources available because of some things they did some years before. And even though it's not tangible, it's like a mosaic. You do little steps along the way, and before you know, you have this beautiful picture uh, when they really need it. I also try to get them to understand it's hard because, you know, I'm getting them into, you know, 15 years down the road, 10 years down the road. But I t- try to make them understand those first 10 years after they graduate, they're making the most, probably the most no- amount of and the highest the financial decisions they're going to make. I tell them there'll be car loans. There'll be potentially a mortgage. There'll be babies somewhere down the line. There'll be their student loans. There may even be a business loan because they may get into a practice or start one or eventually become a partner of a business. So it's getting them to realize they have to fit their student loans and indebtedness into their other aspects of their life. And how they do that, they have to start thinking about now. Now, the fortunate thing I tell them is that you have six different repayment plans. It's based on what you're going to do, you, you know, where you're going to be and what, what, what your plans are, how long your residency and fellowship is, how short your residency and fellowship is. We can figure out something. And then I tell them we have measures too. We had a 0.8% default rate. Can you imagine that? 0.8% default rate. But my colleagues will tell you similar kinds of things across the country because they're actually entering medicine, although a turbulent time, uh, when you think about the new health care plan and what that's going to mean, and a lot of it's unknown. By 2020, there should be 90,000 physicians leaving or retiring from the profession. It's going to be uh, a tremendous hole, especially since 30 million new people are coming in. So they really are going into the profession at a good time. And I think it's 110,000 people by 2025. So timing's right, it's costly, but it can be managed, and there's a lot of good data to show that. But if they take ownership, if they get involved right from the start, if they follow the true experts, the financial aid folk who are, many of us, 20 plus years in the business, and they um, you know, go along the way, and we teach them things they need to know at different life stages, that's what I want them to do so they aren't surprised when they leave. They borrowed more than they had to, and it's making life a little bit harder for them. The other thing I always remind them of, Ryan, I know I did it with you, and, I, and I, I, I've been doing it for almost 20 years now, is about this whole credit card um, 
phenomenon that we have. It's better now in this country, believe it or not. Younger people coming out of college, where we inherit students, are carrying less debt. That's a good thing. But if, if we have a plan here, and if we have multiple kinds of options, and we have plans, and you have one piece that's out of whack, and that's the credit card debt, you've thrown off your plan. So I have to remind them of that as they go along the way, to take control of that. And if you do, you can make this work. And believe it or not, you can still pick the specialty you want. You can uh, go to the part of the country you want with family, friends, or loved ones. You could still make this work. And that's an absence of any of the military options that are available, public uh, National Public Health Service scholarships or loan repayment plans that are available. Some of the states that still have plans, they have a lot of options. And that's the thing I begin to tell them once they come for an interview. Before we even be, that's actually the beginning of our relationship. <laughs> I figure 190 or so are going to come to uh, New York Medical College. Hopefully they'll remember my face and what I said. But in a way, we really start the relationship. So when I get them here in August, Within 10 days, and I, this is something that I thank the anatomy and histology department, they've, they've built me into the schedule. So I get to do this financial seminar within 10, or 10 days or two weeks. And, and that's the second flaw of what we're doing. I started with the interviews. We sit down at this two-hour thing and we go through some other things and reinforce some of the stuff I told them that they may have forgotten a little bit of. So that's the plan. Okay. Let me ask you, you'd mentioned that students can return money yes. within the first four months. Is that something that's unique to New York Med, or is that something that's available to anybody? This rule is for all students, the 120-day rule, the four-month rule, is for all students in this country who are borrowing money as they go through school. If within the first four months you can send money back to your service or thus the government, to a servicer, um, that money will affect the principal balance of the loan you took out that semester. And, and, and the good thing about that is that you've now lowered the principal balance. Any little interest disappears. They treat it as a refund. And any new interest that will accrue, because now on the graduate school level, your Stafford loans and your Grad Plus loans are all unsubsidized. And so any new interest that will accrue will um will be on a smaller balance since you've just lowered it down. That's a good thing. Um, and get, and it, it does a number of things. Obviously, it's, it's saving you money. Um, and you've just paid yourself a gift later on down your life because that's money you're not going to have to deal with. But it gets them in a habit of taking control again of, of their, their, their indebtedness. Because a lot of students feel, oh, my God, this is terrible. My life is ruined. I can't do anything about it. Sure you can. You can do it as you go. You always make sure you borrow what you need. Make sure you have enough money to get you through each semester and thus the whole academic year. And if you find that you've you've learned to cook and you're saving money that way, or um, you've been able to buy your books inexpensively, you're, you know how to, you're really good at travel to go home for the holidays, to get great fares or train fares or whatever it may be. Well, then you're realizing you have some extra money, then send it back. And they make it so easy for you to do, Ryan. You, you find out who your servicer is. The government outsources to a number of services. They can't do it all by themselves, but they have some people, servicers and companies who are experts at this. And you find out who they assigned you. You go to their website, set up a free account, put in your routing number for your checking or savings account, and you have a profile. It's great privacy and security. And every time you have extra money, you go in and say, I want to send it right back to this loan. Here's $500. You press the button, it's gone. By the next day, the government has, has your money from your checking account, and it's back to the government. So it is a very good tool, A, to save money, B, to get people in the proper mindset. Um, I'm sure there are students at other schools who will just borrow, 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 and some of it they don't need and they, have, and they play with. They use it for the wrong reasons. I'm constantly harping on that. And I think our students, for the most part, do. When, when we leave uh, and the students are doing their graduate, graduation questionnaire, we're always below the national average for credit card debt while in school. Um, because that's the one thing, credit card debt, that can ruin the plans. So if they're borrowing wisely, only borrowing what they need, 
sending money back if they don't need it, and keeping the credit card debt as low as possible, they have a chance. Okay. Let's talk about credit card debt for a minute. Yeah. With all the new credit card rules that the government's putting out as far as students obtaining credit cards, I remember when I was on campus in undergraduate school in 98 to 2002, I I was signing up for credit cards left and right and getting cool free t-shirts. I mean, I don't care about my credit score. I got a cool t-shirt. Right. But some of that's going away. It's It's making, the government's making it harder for the credit card companies to offer students credit cards. But for the students out there that have credit cards, maybe uh, maybe they're career changers and they're adults and they have their credit cards and, and other forms of debt. What kind of challenges are these students facing coming into medical school, having any sort of income being pulled out from under them mm-hmm. and still having debt on top of it? Yeah, that's probably the toughest group coming into med school in some ways. Because they had a lifestyle. They were working. They had entertainment. They had trips and vacations and all the normal things that all of us like to do. And all of a sudden, I put them them on a pretty rigid budget, sort of. You know, they're basically lifting off loans instead of an income. And they may have some savings and they may have some uh, wishes and desires or or, uh, engagements that they're used to, whether it be with friends every once in a while or family or outings. And it's really hard for them. So it, when I have the opportunity to talk to someone who um, who had a lifestyle before, and by the way, our entering class this past year, the average age was 25. I don't know if that's a national trend, but that is very interesting. So they have at least a couple of years um, outside of uh, graduating from college and now having to make some adjustments. Well, the key thing, my biggest worry is this. They still want to live the way they lived, and they can't because there's only so much money that we can give them. And our budgets are reasonable, but they're not extravagant. Um, And they would then turn to one of two things, their savings, which I do not want them to do, because once they leave, they have to have a nest egg because they may need down payments for things, a car, maybe a mortgage, depending on where they match. It could be a very reasonable cost of living area. That's number one. I don't want them blowing it all on um, one semester, which is probably what it would cost, or going to credit cards and continuing to keep that lifestyle up. And then when they are out of school, well, first of all, you could blow your whole credit card rating while you're in school, and then you would have difficulty getting one of the loans you need for school. Then it would encompass you getting a cosigner. So now your life's starting to take a, a turn that will involve other people. Now someone has to co-sign your loans. So that's the first thing. And the other effect of having to go to credit cards because you want to keep your lifestyle up is that you've now you've out added a bunch of money that you have to deal with once you're out and you have all these other plans now that you've graduated, now you're finishing your residency or your fellowship, and you still have maybe ten or $20,000, and I've seen in some cases, of credit card debt That's kind of putting a wrench in your plan. So it's constantly getting the message across, having them realize they sacrifice a little bit now for the greater gain later on down the road. And I also try to remind them, which you now understand, there could be other people in your life. This isn't just about you now. The, the, The foundation you're laying down is for other people, you know, a, a, a partner or a spouse that, Uh, you haven't met yet or will be in your life or some children who will be in your life. And you have to think about that. So it's kind of changing the mindset, but it's also real dollars, trying to make them work with the budget. I'm constantly saying, I am available. Come in, let's talk, throw out your spend. And we don't call it a budget as much anymore, Ryan. We call it a spending plan because theoretically you have to spend money. Nothing wrong with that. Mm. You just have to do it wisely and you have to plan ahead. So I say, come on, let's talk about your spending plan. What do you need to do? What, what, what's carrying over from your previous life, so to speak? And, you know, for the most part, it, was, it seems to work. There's always a couple that you don't see who get themselves in trouble. You see them later on and it's, um, you have less options. You know, it's kind of in the medical field. If you, if you treat a, an affliction or a, uh, something that's happening in your body earlier, you have a better chance. 
that's the same kind of approach that I like to take. Yeah, and unfortunately, finances are one of those kind of taboo subjects that people don't like to admit they have issues with. That's absolutely true. And one of the things I try to do, not only with the me meeting them during the uh, applicant process, is if I can get them to trust me, if I can get them to realize you can open up to me, first of all, there's confidentiality rules all over the place, which I adhere to. I never share anything that's ever said in my office or even we're walking down the hallways with anyone. If I can get them to trust me and open up and realize that, you know, you, you, you can talk to me and we, you know, I'm not going to pass judgment. No, mm. let's, let's fix it. I mean, if someone comes to you with a broken, broken arm, you're going to say, Oh, for goodness sakes, what the hell? We, no, you got to fix it. It's simply what I want to do <clears throat> and, and, and teach them along the way or advise them along the way. Or again, get them to realize they have more control over this than they, than they realize. So it is, it is a touchy subject. And, and also, Ryan, it's also entangled and entwined with family. Um, how they saw their parents deal with financial issues is part of it. Um, and in some cases, I see students who are you know, trying to help their family because they're going through a little bit of a nut and economic hardship. And it's one thing to have, you need a lot of support in med school, as you know, but if you become the support then you're, you're financially draining yourself and it, and it adds another dimension to what our conversations are going to be like. So, um, you know, I'll take them as they come, but you know, they, they, they have to realize they have more control over this than they, than they possibly could ever have imagined. Okay. Let's talk about your financial plan, the, the not budget anymore. What, what goes into that? What, what can a student coming in expect their, I'll call it a budget just for the sake of being yeah. easy. What, sure. what can that student expect the budget to cover? Okay. The budget obviously covers the tuition and direct fees. So the, the, we call them direct costs that you will deal with for any institution. So it's tuition fees. And if you're living on campus and uh, you're, you're in campus housing, there'll be a direct fee one semester at a time for your housing. Okay. Pretty much everything else is what we call indirect, but it's still necessary that you focus on it, such as food, obviously. Um, and if you're living off campus, it's housing, books and supplies. Now, supplies could be your theth- your uh, ethoscope, your um, uh, whatever, whatever the kind of a medical equipment that you need, Um that and you then have what we call well you have transportation you're allowed to go home once in a while and see family and friends and you have to get to and fro if you have a preceptorship that you're going to or whatever so there's transportation then we also have miscellaneous which kind of covers all the little odds and ends the the, the toothpaste and the, sometimes you need new shoes and some clothing and and odds and ends along the way so it's pretty basic but it's not Terribly restricted. You have to strike a balance, Ryan, between establishing a budget at a school um, with all these items that can can at least satisfy basic needs. It's not you're not going to be buying Prada uh, kinds of uh, scrubs. You're basically going to be able to get through the year. But you also don't want it so restrictive that it causes students to go to credit cards because they don't have enough. Now it's one thing if they do that because they want a lifestyle. It's another thing because you've made it so restrictive, they just don't have enough money. So you always try to strike that balance. And in recent years, I've been doing some surveys, especially on the rent item, because the rent tends to be the biggest part of the budget. And we're pretty much right in there. What students are telling us they're spending is about what we're telling them they need. And some are even doing less. So that's a good sign. So students coming in can expect basic direct costs of tuition fees and having to deal with books and supplies food, rent, certainly if you're on or off campus, and transportation and some miscellaneous along the way. That should do it. Okay. Somebody that is coming in with a family already, maybe one of those career changers we were discussing, and they have they have a kid and they have a wife. The and maybe they were the the breadwinner before and their wife doesn't work. The budget doesn't cover that, is there a way for the budget and the amount of money that somebody's able to borrow? Is there a way to account for family? 
Well, first of all, that is a very challenging and very different situation. I'm glad you brought that up. And I, I'm thinking of some people right now in my mind that I remember seeing four years ago, but now they're graduating. Um, just fundamentally, the financial aid process essentially is in place for the student. We are there to support the student. Um, and with, there are some expectations that if your partner or spouse is with you that they should be contributing as best they can. Now, of course, the next statement is, what if they have a child? What if the cost of daycare is high um, and they can't work and so on and so on? And what if they want to have more children? Because that's their plan. And I'm not going to get involved in saying you should or shouldn't have children. So fine, we have to deal with that. Now, there are institutions, for the most part, that would try to recognize the cost of uh, health care, um, you know, nanny care or uh, daycare, and try to factor that in based on some documentation, of course, into the budget. We also will acknowledge the fact that you need health insurance. We have a single plan. We have a, pl- a married plan. And we have a plan with children. And that cost, we would certainly add into it. Um, we do, and a lot of other schools would add the cost of the extra, of the children and give them an extra 3000 or whatever the cost would be into the budget. So there are some ways that we can add to the budget and make it possible for that family to, and really in a sense they're all attending med school. So you have, I would tell any student or applicant to, to talk to your financial aid office at the respective school you've been accepted to or are thinking about and see how they would be able to adjust somewhat the budget for a family. Okay. There's some leeway along the way. Okay. What would you say to somebody who is an undergrad and looking at the cost of going to medical school and is the the brightest student in all of their classes, but just is so scared of that number that they're thinking of not going to medical school specifically because of the cost. Yeah. You know, that's actually more than just a question. It's, it's very much a concern for our whole profession and, and the, our association, because let me take a step back and, and look ahead. If you look at our country, we are very much changing in terms of our demographics and medicine should reflect the doctors that we put out should not only a reflect um, who we are as a nation, but make sure that we are able to treat all the various kinds of people we have in their religious beliefs, their social or uh, personal beliefs about how they're viewed uh, in, a, in a doctor's office and all of that. So we are very concerned about the population who, who go to med school and become doctors represents this country. And, and for some segments of our country, there are students who, I mean, the cost of one year of a private med school with, with living expenses is prob- it can be more than what the family's taken in in income. And that's daunting and that's scary. And of course, they're always worried, will I make it through and will I be able to do this? And, and let's face it, Brian, after one year or after two years, going to school, whether it be public or private, you're, you're, the, you're over $100,000 and you want to make it through. So what I feel financial aid offices and officers should do is try to make them look ahead. Try to make them realize that if you had to borrow money, there is hope. And I honestly have to say that the, the options of being able to make modest payments for some time with the possibility of loan forgiveness is a way that I can tell them there are, there are, there are laws on the books. There are plans on the books that give you options later on down the road. It's hard for them to see it, but once you start talking about it, you can almost see them taking a, a breather and saying, okay, I got to do some homework. I've got to learn more about it. But the only way I think you can approach that is to try to make them understand one There are many, many different ways to deal with debt that won't choke you. And two, you have so many options available to you uh, um, for the kind of doctor you want to be that will be wide open to you. 
that if this is something a burning desire, you really have this this notion that you you can see yourself spending your life helping people, then we can make it work. I'll tell you one thing, Ryan. If you're really not sure about this now, and you're doing it because you you're, someone's telling you to do it, it sounds prestigious, and you want to be in a prestigious fine. Or someone, or you think I have nothing better to do? Might as well be a physician because that's where they say the bucks will be because there's there's a shortage. If you're doing it for all of those reasons or not for the right reason, don't do it because the cost will be will be troublesome troublesome to you because you you know you just don't think this is the right thing to do and you'll hate every minute of it. But if it is the right thing to, for you to do between working with your financial aid office. And constantly thinking about and knowing about the options, you'll make this work. It won't be so bad. It's not something you'll take lightly, you know, borrowing possibly two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars a year isn't something we take lightly, but it will seem possible. And because it's something you want to do, and we all will be there to support you. And I mean with the faculty, your families, the aid office, and so on. So okay. you know, it's 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 work. It takes some work, and the the numbers show that it does work. The yes. the small default rate shows that people are doing this day in and day out. Day in and day out, Darren. I've been at New York Medical College now, will be twenty eight years, and I don't think our default rates ever exceeded five percent, and I've seen it down as low as zero, <laughs> and that's just one school, and it's not an industry that the Department of Ed ever worries about. Um. You've oh, and I have to give the, the industry credit. It they control the supply and demand very well. Um, unlike, I must say, some other professions, the law profession is struggling a little bit with this because they have we have about one hundred and thirty five med schools. They have two hundred. We put out about eighteen thousand students a year, graduates a year. They put out thirty five thousand. So what, what you're seeing is that simple economics. Yeah, you have less. You have more demand and less supply. You're going to have trouble finding work. So I have to give a lot of things credit here. The profession takes care of itself well. I like to think my colleagues around the country at the medical schools are are keeping up on their keeping up with their business. They we all go to the conferences. We go to the, all the major ones. We learn the new plans. We we ask questions. We advise and give back to our students. I think it's a combination of things that makes it work. And that's the kind of thing, go back to your question, what do you tell someone who's faced with this kind of cost and this, this whole thing of getting through med school? What are some of the things you tell them? I, I, I try to tell them all of this. I try to put it into context that you're entering at a good time. We take care of you. The profession takes care of you. There are a lot of dedicated people you're going to meet along the way that will support you and help you, and everyone will need support. There are times when you doubt yourself, and there are people there to uh, to, to to lift you up. So, you know, that's kind of what we, we tell them, how we approach it. Okay. When a student's applying for financial aid, what effect does credit score and maybe a, a bankruptcy history have Yes. On that application. Excellent question. There's a short-term answer, and I have more of a long-term. A lot of what I want to always do with students is think ahead. All right, let's look at it short-term. All right, so you're, you're, you're accepted. You're making your application for your financial aid for your first year, and you had a bankruptcy in the past. Um, on the federal side, they're a little, a little less. What they look for is different, perhaps, than a consumer organization would look for. Um, they're looking to see that over the last three months of your life um, that you've you've been good. You've made payments on any outstanding debts that you have, and you haven't gotten yourself into trouble. Um, if the bankruptcy was a while ago and you're on a road to recovery, that is that's a good thing. But it's what's happening in the last three months, six months, what's happening in your recent life that matters the most. And um, if there are problems, you're not cut out. First of all, the Stafford loans, which can be up to about $45,000 on the graduate level, depending on the cost of the school and the number of months in the school year, could be up to about $45,000. That is in credit check. So you, you, you will be able to get that money, assuming you're you know, a citizen or permanent resident and you haven't defaulted on any previous 
federal loans. You're fine. And it comes down to the next loan, the grad plus, that, that pretty much goes up to budget. If you had that problem and it's more recent and right now you're having trouble passing your credit check, which they will do, then you can go for a co-signer who has to have a good credit history. Now, if you fix things and it's now the second year and you apply and you're good, you'll get, your, you'll get the loan on your own. So um, it's not the end of the world. It, it would require you asking someone else to co-sign the loan. And co-signing means, it's not asking for a reference. Co-signing means they are responsible if you default later on down the road. So it keeps people in school. There are alternative ways that they can get the funding. But right away, if I know that ex problem exists, I just sit down and start talking with them and seeing what they can do to get out of that default situation or that um, negative situation. And because I'm thinking long term, I say, someday you're going to need to go for a credit check for a car or a credit check for a mortgage. And you're going to have to be able to be healthy again, um, just like the way you treat a patient. You know, let's get through this period, but let's see what steps you can take so you can have a better, healthy life. Same, same concept. Is there a specific number when you think of credit score that the, the uh, government's looking for or even uh, other loan companies? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, uh, the reason why I have for the, probably the last 20 years been telling applicants, go get your credit scores. I want to see your scores. I don't want to know your detail. I'm not being nosy. I was, but it's really an exercise to make sure they know what this whole world of credit scoring is about and credit reports are about. Look them over and see if there's any mistakes, which I heard 20% of them have mistakes. And start to learn that part of your life because that's how you're going to be judged financially. So we've been always doing that. We've been always asking him to do that ahead of time. And I've had students who finally came and said, wow, I'm so glad, Tony, you told me to do that. I found out why we weren't getting a mortgage, my wife and I, and you know, we were trying. And sure enough, there was a mistake on our report. We fixed it and we're okay. Or I didn't know this was happening or I didn't know this was happening. And in some sad cases, Ryan, some parents have taken out credit cards in their children's name and unfortunately ruined their credit, at least at that point in their lives, and the students didn't know that. So that's the first thing. Yes, things have changed since the recent debt, uh, economic crisis we've had in this country. Uh, it was, uh, let me give you a little sense of credit reporting scores. You know, it's like 350. That's very low. I haven't seen that. Up to 850. If we're, And I'm talking about FICO scores, which are the standard, uh, which about 90% of industry uses their scores and their, their algorithms and, and so on. So 350 to, to about 850. It used to be, Ryan, before 2007, 8, when we had our crisis, I would say to a student or an applicant, make sure your scores are over 620. That's what everyone's looking for, and that's what gets you money. Now I have to tell them, you have to be over 700. They've, they've certainly raised the bar, and they're, they're not taking as many risks. They mean the corporate world, the consumer world, uh, and so on. So it's even more important now that you start to look at and focus on what you're doing with your money because you know, somebody's watching, so to speak, and somebody's tallying up your behavior, your financial behavior. So um, the first thing I would tell anyone to do is, by law, since 2004, you and I, everyone in this country, once a year, can go to annualcreditreport.com, www annualcreditreport.com and get the three major credit reporting agencies reports for free. Now, these are reports, multiple pages. They will list all your activity. If you have two credit cards, they'll say, this is your credit card and this is your activity and this is your rating on that. You're good. You're current. You're not delinquent and so on and so forth. They will list your loans. If you have any student loans, it'll say deferred, not to worry. <laughs> Um, and it'll give you a good picture of your financial life. So it, I certainly want them to do that coming in. But I also tell fourth years it's time to do it again because you're going to probably ask for credit checks on cars and other parts of your new financial life. So you also want to make sure, A, no mistakes, and B, you're still healthy. It's like going to the doctor once a year. You're perfect. This is something that everybody should be doing. Same thing financially. Go to the financial doctor, get it checked, and make sure you're healthy. So yes, things have tightened up. So even more now, you have to you have to be 
really, really good with your finances. Well, folks, again, that was Tony Sozo, the student financial planning director over at New York Medical College. He will probably be on the show multiple times in the future because he just loves sharing this kind of information, as you could probably tell. And I want you guys to go ahead and contact us. Let us know what kind of information you want to hear in the future from Tony. And for any other topic, you can email us, feedback at medicalschoolhq.net. We're on Twitter, at medicalschoolhq. Or again, medicalschoolhq.net slash session 21 will bring you into the show notes for this podcast session and you can leave a, a comment there if you would like. As always, I hope the information provided today will help better guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Make sure to join us next time here at the Medical School Headquarters. 